Okay, uh, very good. So welcome back everyone. Please do click on the new link to the lecture notes that Andre has put in the chat. Um, it's updated, there's a section two and so on. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so this is lecture two. Um, and uh, I want to finish a couple things from uh, the section one of the notes. The first is, and, and you know, maybe this is like the most important thing of all these lectures is to just give you a glossary uh, to translate between uh, statistical physics and combinatorics. And so, you know, if you, if you leave these lectures and you're interested in combinatorics, I would, I would be very happy if you, when you hear the statistical physics terms, you say, okay, I remember what this means and this is what this means in my context. So somehow this is one of the most important things. Uh, the next is I want to talk about moments, uh, cumulants, and joint cumulants. Uh, and this will give a relation between things like correlations and expectations and derivatives of the log partition function. And this is a really convenient uh, way to work with uh, these things. Uh, and then the, then the topic of section two um, will be extremal problems for regular graphs. And so, so finally in section two, we'll really get into combinatorics and say, let's prove some combinatorics theorems, but from the perspective of this statistical physics stuff. Uh, so that's, that's the plan. Um, let me also say um, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, I'll have like office hours after the lecture and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link on Tuesday, but if you have like questions or wanna ask about exercises or anything, so next Tuesday, I'll, I'll have office hours immediately following. Uh, good. So let's talk about translating between uh, statistical physics and combinatorics. And so remember, you know, what's our setting at the moment? We have, uh, just in, in a lot of generality, we have some partition function, which is the sum over all configurations and say so like uh, omega, some finite set to the V, uh, E to the minus beta times some energy function. And as Andres uh, pointed out and emphasized, this energy function is computable locally by summing over vertices and edges. Um, and, and that's quite important. So that's the partition function. And then the, the Gibbs measure, the probability distribution, is the probability distribution with the partition function as a normalizing constant. Uh, so uh, the probability we assign to a particular configuration sigma is e to the minus beta times energy uh, over the partition function. Uh, and, and that's our setup. And we talked about uh, uh, all sorts of things last time, including phase transitions, correlations, and so on. Uh, and now what I wanna do is just give you a table of what do these things translate to in combinatorics. Uh, and so this is in the notes, but we'll, we'll go through it. So on one hand, you have statistical physics. And on the other hand, you have combinatorics. And maybe we'll approach this from the perspective of combinatorics. So, uh, you know, what is a classic problem in combinatorics? You want to find the extreme object. So I think the running example I have in the notes was Mantel's theorem. Uh, which uh, graph on n vertices that's triangle free has the most edges? Okay, and so it's a classic result that the, the triangle free graph with the most edges, uh, you take a, a balance by partition and put all the edges uh, that you can between. So a complete bipartite graph with a balanced bipartition. And so we're looking for the extremal object. Okay. Which uh, configuration, so now configurations are just graphs, uh, which configuration has, you know, optimizes this quantity. In statistical physics, the, the extremal objects would be the ground states. Which configurations minimize this energy function? And really, it's, it, this is a uh, real one-to-one -one correspondence. It's the same thing. Uh, you just put your energy function, minimizing the energy function would be maximizing whatever combinatorics parameter uh, you're interested in. Okay, now, now that you have um, Mantel's theorem, one thing you could ask is, how many tri triangle-free graphs are there on n vertices? This is the counting problem in combinatorics. Okay, and of course, for us, the counting problem is, uh, you know, computing or approximating the partition function. How many configurations are there uh, satisfying some constraints? How many weighted configurations are there if we uh, pick some uh, beta, uh, positive beta? Okay, so the, the, the counting problem, uh, the number of objects, this is computing the partition function. 
the other the other question you could ask, and and this I think probably uh, people know the answer to, uh, for this Mantell's theorem setting, if you pick a typical triangle-free graph, what does it look like? Well, it's actually a bipartite graph. Okay, so uh, this is a famous result in combinatorics. So what is, uh, does a typical object look like? And so this corresponds in the statistical physics side. This is understanding the Gibbs measure. What does a, a, configure, a typical configuration drawn according to the Gibbs measure look like? Um, and OK, so often in combinatorics, uh, if we're talking about how many triangle-free graphs are there uh, on n vertices, it's, there's going to be some exponential. Um, and you know, often we're interested in the constant, you know, first of all, the, the, the uh, growth rate of n and the exponent, but also the constant. And somehow the constant and the exponent of a count, this is just the uh, pressure or free energy that we defined last time in statistical physics, this limit 1 over n log partition function. Um, Good. I, I think I put a couple more things in the uh, in in the the table. Uh, you know, if you want to understand things at zero temperature, you're you're talking about the actual the set of ex, extremal objects. And so, in combinatorics, often we want to know is the is the extremal example unique? Are there multiple extremal examples? When there's multiple extremal examples, somehow. Uh, proving things becomes much more tricky. Um, and then the maybe the most interesting thing on the table is, you know, this, the study of statistical physics mostly happens at positive temperature. Beta is not zero, not infinity. Uh, beta is some positive number. Um, and we want to understand, if we understand these extremal objects, so in the case of this triangle-free uh, graph thing, these are these complete bipartite graphs. Um, one thing we can ask is, okay, if you're near extremal, if you're not quite extremal, but you're near extremal, what do you look like? What's the typical structure of a uh, triangle-free graph with uh, fewer, a little bit fewer than the maximal number of edges? Um, and the, the, the way to phrase this as a, a statistical physics question is, do you uh, see um, the influence of the ground states, let's say a ground state, the ground state, in a typical object at po uh, positive temperature. Okay. So, in other words, what, what we're asking in the combinatoric side is, if you pick a, uh, if you look at a, a typical or a random uh, triangle-free graph with fewer than n squared over four edges, so I don't know, 90% times n squared over four, do you still see the um, influence of this ground state? I mean, the answer is yes in this case. We know this in combinatorics. Uh, I think we know that you, in fact, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're always bipartite with probably one or probably tending to one, um, but we do see the influence of the ground state there. And this is exactly the statistical physics question. Uh, the statistical physicists would go further, though. They wouldn't just be content to know, is a typical, does a typical uh, object, um, you know, a uniformly random object show influence of the ground state? What you really want to know is add, add this new parameter, the temperature, that lets you interpolate between pure independence and pure optimization. And you want to know, at what point do you stop seeing the influence of the ground state? Okay. So at what temperature. So you, when I say temperature, you should think strength of interaction. In this, in this case I've, I've been discussing, this is like the edge density. At what temperature do you stop seeing influence of the ground state? OK, and this is the question of like identifying a phase transition.
Will, can you quickly say uh, why the temperature is the same as the density? It's just so, the um, so here, let's say you're thinking GNP, right? Uh, you're thinking GNP, what are you really doing? You're picking uh, probably if G is proportional to, let's say, lambda to the number of edges. But you can write this as E to the log, you know, log lambda uh, times number of edges. And I'm thinking of like log lambda is like beta, like inverse temperature. So the interaction here, uh, if you're just talking GMP, the interaction is just, it's just on the edges uh, and it's just saying, you know, give me more weight if I have more edges. And so all I'm saying is, uh, as lambda gets large, I'm, I'm calling that temperature getting lower. Okay, so any, any questions about this sort of table, this glossary, um, before we go on? So a combinatorial object corresponds to a distribution in statistical mechanics. I just want to double check. No, I, I would say um, your, your class of combinatorial objects, so let's say all graphs on n vertices correspond to the set of configurations. Um, the distribution, it, you know, a distribution is like picking a random combinatorial object. Uh, it's just that in the statistical physics perspective, we add this extra parameter uh, to, to sort of tune the distribution in, in different ways. Tune it between picking a uniformly random extremal object and picking just a uniformly random configuration. Uh, and we interpolate between the two. Um, so is it possible to say what a distribution corresponds to? It corresponds to picking a random object, like let's say a random uh -huh. triangle-free graph. I but you, ha you, you have to specify with, according to what distribution. And the statistical physics perspective would say you want to pick it proportional uh, to some exponential, maybe proportional to exponential the number of edges. But that's just saying you want to look at GNP condition of being triangle free. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, you did say that. Uh, the zero temperature corresponds to extremal objects. That seems reasonable. Yes. Positive, positive temperature, you say stability. Could you explain uh, in a few words? Yeah, so stability, that, I mean, I'm, I don't know so much about combinatorics, I have to say, but stability, I think what they ask is, you know, the, let's say for the Mantel's theorem, the extremal number, you have, the most edges you can have is n squared over four, and we know that the extremal objects are these complete balanced bipartite graphs. The stability question, as far as I know, is you ask, what if you have a triangle-free graph with 0.9 times n squared over four edges? And yes. you want to know, what do those objects look like? But how does it uh, correspond to positive temperature? Do you see? Ah, okay, because, you know, um, if, if we talk about this Gibbs measure here, you're picking a triangle-free graph with probably proportional to lambda to the number of edges, if lambda is positive, the expected number of edges you'll get will be less than n squared over four. Oh, okay. And so a typical, a typical realization from this Gibbs you, measure. You mean if, if lambda is, is bigger than one or, or smaller, bigger than one? Uh, I mean, if lambda is no, no, smaller. It, I mean, it will always be less than n squared over four. n squared over four you would only get if you somehow took lambda to infinity. Oh, okay. um, and so, and so that's, what, that's what I mean by positive temperatures like the stability problem. You're looking at a typical object, um, and, but not insisting that you, you're supported on the ground states. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So let's, let's continue. Uh, and uh, this part will be like a little bit of a probability review um, uh, focused on statistical mechanics. So uh, again, um, we said that uh, this energy function, h of sigma, is a local function, sum over, sum over functions on vertices and edges. Um, and we can think of this as a random variable. It's a random variable uh, with uh, sigma drawn according to the Gibbs measure. OK, and this tells us something. So you know, it, uh, it tells us some statistic of the model. Uh, statistic 
related to the phase transition. So for example, um, you know, okay, if you, if you write the hardcore model in the right way, you know, H of sigma is the size of the independent set. And uh, so this is hardcore for easing H of sigma uh, is the number of edges cut. Okay, so these are, these are things that if I show you a big picture of the configuration, you can compute. And we sort of wanna understand how, it is, how does this statistic, this random variable, uh, how does its distribution change as we change parameters of the model? Uh, so we wanna, you know, what would we wanna know? We would want to know as a start, let's say expectation of this, we would wanna know the variance of this and maybe, maybe higher moments, but certainly the expectation and the variance. Um, okay, um, so let me say we have a random variable x, the moment generating function, is expectation e to the tx is a function of t. So this is just an arbitrary random variable. Um, now, probably you've seen that. I, some, some people may have seen this, the cumulant generating function. Uh, is the logarithm of the moment generating function. So this is, uh, this is called the cumulant generating function. And then we use this to define the cumulants of x. Okay, so the cumulants of a random variable x are the coefficients of the following power series. So kx of t equals sum n equals one to infinity, kappa n. So these are, these are the coefficients. These are the cumulants, kappa n of x, uh, t to the n over n factorial. Okay, so in other words, the, the case cumulant of a random variable x is the Oh, sorry, the nth cumulant of a random variable x, kappa, that's supposed to be a kappa, kappa n of x is the nth derivative of the cumulant generating function evaluated at zero. Um, and so these are related to the moments. They're basically the moments, but in a different basis. Uh, so let me just tell you the first cumulant of x is the expectation. The second cumulant of x is the variance and so on. Um, there's some other linear combinations of the first k moments. Uh, and there's some, there's some reasons that the, this is a useful basis to look at. Uh, so one, one reason is uh, if let's say z is normal 0, 1, then kappa 1 of z is 0, kappa 2 of z is 1, and kappa k of z is 0 for all k at least. Okay, so the, the normal distribution, in fact, is characterized by the property that uh, the higher cumulants after two vanish. Okay, so if you want to prove that some uh, a sequence of random variables converges to a Gaussian, all you have to do is show that the third and higher cumulants tend to zero. Uh, so that's nice. Another example would be, let's say, y is uh, Poisson lambda, then all the cumulants. Uh, or equal to lambda. Okay, so uh, there's there's some good reasons in uh, probability and combinatorics that these are nice uh, representations of the moments, um, but they are particularly nice in statistical physics, and that's that's because remember here we have our partition function, this looks an awful lot like a moment generating function of H. of this random variable h, the random energy. Um, and it, so it turns out that uh, 
the, the log of the partition function uh, is uh, essentially like the uh, cumulant generating function. for this random variable h. Um, and so, yeah, so what, what can we compute? Uh, we can compute things like this. The expectation of this random variable, the, the energy, is just the derivative with respect to beta of log z of beta. I think there's actually a minus because we have e to the minus. And this is minus kappa one of h. And uh, I, I give you in the notes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to actually just derive this. You're, you're taking the, the derivative of log z. So this is the derivative of z over z. Uh, and then you get an h that comes down. And then you see that you get the expectation uh, minus the expectation of h. OK, so uh, the first derivative of the log partition function is the expectation of the energy. Um, and then, as you might imagine, the variance of h is just the second derivative. Okay, and this is this is true in general. The case cumulant of the energy is minus one to the k uh, case derivative. And this min minus one is because in the exponent we write minus beta and not beta. Exactly, that's exactly right. So you could all you could alternatively not have the minus one and take a derivative with respect to minus beta. Okay, and so this also this also explains a little bit why um, the derivatives of the free energy indicate phase transitions of the model uh, because this is really telling you these these somehow are the limiting um, limiting values of the, the cumulants of this energy. Okay, so any questions there? We're going to see that this is quite useful uh, in combinatorics in a, in a bit. Um, but the other thing I want to say is, is talk about joint cumulants and uh, multivariate partition functions. And so uh, a, a theme of this of these lectures is that you know the statistical physics way of looking at things is via correlations. And we talked about the uh, joint marginals last time, and we talked about the truncated uh, two-point correlation function, which is like the covariance basically between two spins. And um, you know, so it somehow you know for understanding the behavior of the model, for understanding phase transitions. Uh, we really want to be able to get our hands on these correlations, these uh, joint marginals, the truncated uh, k-point correlation functions, and so on. It turns out that we, if we modify the partition function a little bit, we can actually uh, obtain all this information by taking partial derivatives of the log partition function. Okay, and so the idea here is we will add non-uniform external fields uh, to all, all vertices. OK, so what do I mean external field? Uh, the way I defined the easing model, there was no external field. The, the energy function was just a function of edges. But the hardcore model, there was this external field. We were saying, pick a configuration with probability proportional to uh, lambda to the number of vertices. And so we, we had some multiplier um, for including, for setting uh, spins to one, uh, but we can do this in general. So um, I, want, I want to think now alpha is a vector indexed by vertices. And now I'm going to look at the, the following partition function. Now I'm going to think of it as a function of alpha. We can think of beta fixed at the moment. Uh, we want to sum over all configurations. Uh, and now what do I want to say? I want to say e to the 
uh, sum over v, alpha v sigma v, times e to the minus h, uh, e to the minus beta h of sigma. Okay, so it's the old partition function, e to the minus beta times energy, but I've, I've put in these external fields. And so, you know, all I'm saying is that for each, uh, for each vertex v, I have a, a, a specific local function. Um, I, you, you could make this part of the energy, but I'll keep it separate from the energy. But you have a specific local function, which is just the spin sigma v times some constant alpha v, which is particular to the vertex. And so these are, these are the external fields. If you think of the, the distribution as being like uniform over all configurations, but then uh, reweighted by exponential of e to the minus energy, what we're doing with the external fields is changing the prior distribution uh, to make it not uniform. And then we're still reweighting by e to the minus beta energy. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a good, um, that's a perfectly fine model. Uh, and now, now the idea is that we can look at the partial derivatives of, the, um, of this, the new log partition function with respect to the external fields. Uh, and so I, I think I, I did one of the calculations. So let's look at the partial derivative uh, with respect to alpha v of log z of alpha. Okay, so this is, this is a logarithmic derivative, so it's the partial of z over z. And so now, now what happens, now look at the partition function above, um, and what's going to happen if we take a derivative with respect to alpha v? Um, well, um, yeah, what's going to happen? Um, we're going to get a sum over all configurations. And uh, basically a sigma v will come down, right? And I'll call this e to the alpha dot sigma. There is a comment in the, in the chat. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Let me see, all right, close the chat for a Ah, the external field looks like what physicists put as the current J in quantum field theory. Uh, sure, I, I don't know anything about quantum field theory, but thank you. Um, very good. Uh, I, I don't know any relation. I don't know anything about quantum field theory, but uh, I would be, I, it would be great if you, if you could tell me uh, something like that. Um, okay, so let's just continue this calculation, and then we have divided by Z. And so what is this? This actually just gives you expectation, right? So this, this here, this is just mu of sigma. And so this calculation gives us expectation sigma v, which is the marginal at v. Uh, very good. And so uh, we recovered the marginal by taking a partial derivative. Uh, I won't go through the calculation, but uh, what you can see is if you take the mixed partial, so if you uh, take a partial with respect to uh, alpha u and alpha v of log z, you get, uh, you don't get the joint marginal, you get the, you get mu u v minus mu u mu v, which is the truncated I think we call this kappa of uv. The truncated two-point correlation function. OK, and so. Uh, Wait, so he, sorry, so here you're computing the expectation. Uh, the, your distribution is based on this new log partition function. or. Uh, yeah, uh, but you, you can, if you put, if you set them all to zero, if you set them all to zero, you haven't changed. Okay. So, so really, yeah, re really, we want to evaluate this at zero. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very good. Um, 
great. Uh, and so, yeah, and so these are, you obtain these things that you want to understand with the, uh, these correlations. And, and this is somehow not a, not a coincidence. So um, this is, these are exactly the uh, joint cumulants of the random variable sigma b. Okay. So the, you know, the joint cumulant, so you can, if you have a collection of random variables, then the, uh, the joint cumulant generating function is um, log expectation e to the t1x1 plus t2x2 plus tkxk joint cumulant generating function. And so, and, and then the cumulants are, are literally just defined as the partial derivatives of this. Okay, and, and the, the one property of uh, the joint cumulants that's interesting is, so let's say we have kappa, this is a joint cumulant of xk. Uh, this equals zero if these random variables are independent. Okay, and so somehow um, by taking the, the partial derivatives of um, the log partition function with these external fields, we get some measurement of how uh, independent spins are in the model. Okay, good. So uh, I think that, that wraps up this section one. Are there, are there any questions about this section one before we go on to section two? So did I, did I understand correctly? If you take a derivative over xi ki times, exactly this cumulant corresponding to the same uh, uh, derivative of this log. Uh, yeah, so if you take the, the, the derivative with respect to the same variable k times, you get the cumulant. And then if you do mixed partial, yeah. you get joint cumulant. That's right. Okay. Okay, great. So um, let's go on to, to section two, extremal problems for regular graphs. And um, let me uh, actually even very first thing I, I'll do is if you're, if you're interested in this area, there's a great survey by Yufei Zhao. Uh, it's, it's cited in the notes so you can find it. Um, but this, this uh, describes lots of problems in this area, lots of techniques, lots of open problems, some of which have been solved since uh, he wrote the survey. Um, but uh, you know, I'll only be able to skim, skim this thing, um, but we'll, we'll see some of, some of these results. Um, okay, and so you know, extremal combinatorics, what's the, what's the idea? You say we have some class of graphs and we wanna know the maximum of some parameter of this graph or the minimum of this parameter. And so we saw Mantel's theorem, you have Dirac's theorem. Um, but but you know, often these, these classic theorems are about dense graphs uh, and you end up with dense graphs. But what if you ask like overall uh, large graphs that are D regular for some fixed D, uh, what graph maximizes, I don't know, the um, number of independent sets or minimizes the um, number of matchings? Uh, and so these are, these are the types of problems that, that we'll discuss now. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples of these classic theorems. So theorem, and this is due to Jeff Kahn. Uh, and the way I'll state it is, let's say, let me write up here, I of G is the number of independent sets of G. And his theorem is the following, for all deregular bipartite graphs G, um, let me say one over number of vertices log number of independent sets is at most one over 2D times log number of independent sets of the complete uh, deregular bipartite graph. 
Okay, so KDD, uh, sorry, well, KDD, the complete deregular bipartite graph, you know, that's just this graph, uh, and unions. They should be N somewhere. Or... Uh, there's, oh, and, and the theorem statement? Uh, no, I, okay. I, yeah, 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 okay, one over V of G on the left, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so I, I particularly wrote it this way, so I didn't have to write, uh, write this. I, I, and, and this is somehow the, the right way to look at things from statistical physics point of view, is if you take the logarithm of a partition function and divide by number of vertices, then somehow you've normalized so that the size of the graph doesn't come into it. Um, but yeah, good observation. Um, but if you want to talk about like a, a more typical statement, it would be that KDD and unions of KDDs maximize the number of independent sets for D regular graphs on, let's say, K times 2D vertices. Okay. Um, and so, so this is an extremal result. Um, and it, it got extended in a couple ways. And so the, the new theorem, and this is from Jeff Kahn, Yufei Zhao, removed this restriction on bipartite. And then David Galvin and Prasad Tedeli extended it to the statistical physics version. So for all deregular graphs G, all lambda greater than zero, one over number of vertices log. Now here, this is the independent set partition function um, or the independence polynomial. This is at most the same thing for KDD. And so of course you can recover the first theorem, the recover result about the number of independent sets by taking lambda equals one. Okay, that gives you the count of the independent sets. Um, but uh, so here's one theorem. So this is, uh, this is the type of theorem we're looking at. Um, maximizing the number of independent sets for deregular graphs. Okay, and then the next theorem is a slightly different form. And this is uh, the question, which triangle free graph Uh, let's say it's D regular. Well, sorry, uh, is the extension to lambda, uh, does it have any combinatorial meaning or is it's statistical mechanical? Um, I mean, it, it, you wouldn't say it's like the count of something, um, but you could, you know, this function Z is the independence polynomial. So it's certainly something that has been studied in combinatorics. I see. Um, Will? Yeah. One, one thing you can do is you can color the independent sets and that gives you uh, integral values of lambda. Yes, this is right. So uh, there, there is a, a way to construct. Uh, yeah, that's right. So you can sort of construct um, other graphs, blow-ups, I, I guess you would call them, uh, and this would give you different values of lambda. And that's actually how this Galvin and Tedeli proof goes. Um, Didn't it correspond to just sampling an independent set of, like, uh, average of average uh, cert certain average size or not, not really well it doesn't tell you at, at the moment it doesn't tell you anything about like the average size of an independent set but we will we will get there um, okay but the second theorem i want to say is is a, a different uh, and also uh, classical result which triangle free graph that's deregular has uh, the smallest independence number Uh, normalized. So let's say alpha of G, this is the largest independent set of G divided by N. Okay, and, and this is a, a result of Shearer. And what his theorem says is for all triangle free graphs of uh, average degree at most D, uh, 
the independence set density, so the independence number divided by n um, is at least, so there's some error that, uh, this is, we're talking about large d here, so this is a one plus little one as d goes to infinity. So the asymptotics are in d, uh, log d over d. So this is uh, this classic result of Shearer. Um, his result is really getting this nice constant one. There was previous result of Itai Komlosh Samaretti uh, that got this order, but a smaller constant. And the nice thing about this is, as a corollary, we get a good bound on R3, the Ramsey number R3k. So this is the uh, largest graph you can have uh, that has no triangle and no independent set of size k. Uh, and this satisfies. Okay, and this is the best current known bound on uh, upper bound on R3k, the lower bound. Uh, due to two groups is uh, at least one quarter. So there still is factor four gap. Um, okay, so uh, so these are somehow two prototypical uh, theorems um, about bounded degree graphs, regular graphs, and uh, independent sets. And what I want to say is, uh, let's let's take the uh, perspective of statistical physics and let's uh, prove uh, variations or strengthenings of these results. And actually the proof uh, for these two results or variants of these, uh, it's, you can do them both in one proof. Um, and so that's what we'll, that's what we'll see. Um, at least we'll start today. Um, good. Uh, so let's start with our discussion of these moments. And so uh, I want to define a quantity. So The, let's say the occupancy fraction. Of the hardcore model. On G at fugacity lambda. So I'll have a alpha G bar. Of lambda is uh, one over the number of vertices. Uh, expectation. So here the expectation is over the hardcore model uh, with on G with frugacity lambda of the size of the independent set. So this is the expected density of an independent set uh, drawn according to the hardcore model. And from our previous discussion, we know that this has a nice representation in terms of derivatives of the log partition function. So uh, alpha G that is uh, lambda times so so notice just be a little bit careful we get this extra factor lambda but that's because we didn't write lambda as e to the alpha we just wrote it as lambda so you get a you get an extra lambda okay so that's that's nice um and uh good and you know another fact from our previous discussion is that alpha g alpha bar g of lambda is strictly increasing in lambda. So why the second derivative of you know properly scaled of the log partition function is the variance of the size of the independent set. And this is strictly positive. So the derivative of alpha, uh, the occupancy fraction is up to scaling the variance, and so this is positive. So we have this nice, uh, strictly increasing function, and it captures uh, combinatorial information. Okay, so for one, uh, Let's say the independent set density. If you want to know the size of the largest independent set, 
Well, you can just take the limit as lambda goes to infinity of this occupancy function. So it, it, in the limit, it encodes the independent set density. Uh, second nice thing is it uh, tells you the number of independent sets in your graph. Uh, so this is, um, let's say, 1 over n log number of independent sets is the integral from 0 to 1 of the occupancy fraction divided by t, evaluated t. OK, and this follows just because um, what we have up here, that it's the you know, alpha uh, bar over lambda is the derivative of the log partition function. OK, so somehow this one object ca uh, captures both the extremal problem and the counting problem. Um, but of course, it's, it's not going to be trivial to calculate this. Um, both of these, of course, are very hard computational problems. Um, very good. Um, and so here's, here's the theme. Let's say the theme. We want to understand how correlations affect the value of this occupancy fraction. So we want to know if, if spins are more correlated, does this make alpha larger? If spins are less correlated or if they're negatively correlated, does this make alpha smaller? And then we somehow want to, we want to look at the statistical physics question from the combinatorial point of view. So the statistical physics question is, how do these correlations behave? And the, you know, the extremal combinatorics perspective on correlations is the following. Which graphs? have the strongest, weakest, most negative, most positive, any question you want, correlations in the hardcore model. Okay, so this is kind of a strange question if you're a statistical physicist. If you're a statistical physicist, you care about ZD. And you want to know, as I change lambda, what happens to the correlations? But as a combinatorics person, you say, well, ZD is just a 2D regular graph. Uh, and I actually care about the, like, the strangest 2D regular graph in the world. Which 2D regular graph maybe has the strongest correlations between uh, certain spins? Or which has the most negatively correlated uh, spins? And these are the questions we'll, uh, we'll try to answer. And then by answering them, we'll be able to prove these new theorems. Uh, OK, so I think I'll, I'll have time to at least set up the method, and then next time we can finish it. Um, a couple of facts. Um, OK, so let me. Okay. So, definition we say V is uncovered. with respect to an independent set i if uh, i intersect the neighborhood is empty. So, it, uh, so v is allowed. v is not blocked. From being an i. OK, so uncovered just means none of your neighbors are in the independent set. And so if I wanted to, I could add v to the independent set. And it, it turns out, and, th and this is an idea that, that goes back to at least Jeff Kahn, um, but has also been used in theoretical computer science. It turns out that instead of looking at correlations between spins, between whether v is occupied or not, it's somehow much nicer to look at correlations between the events that v, u, and so on are uncovered. Uh, this has a this has somehow a nicer uh, mathematical uh, properties, and so we'll use the following facts. So one, 
the probability that V is in the independent set, given that V is uncovered, uh, and this is just true for every graph, is lambda over one plus lambda. Okay, and so again, here we're using this special property of Gibbs measures that if you condition on, a, um, on some set of spins that separate the graph, then what happens on one side is independent of what happens on the other. And so what this is saying is if none of the neighbors of V or N, so I've conditioned on zeros for all the neighbors, so here's V, it's neighbors, none of these guys are N, then V can either be N or out, uh, it's not constrained. And if you're n, you get a factor of lambda out, you get a factor of one. And so the probability of your n is lambda over one plus lambda. Fact two is, uh, and here we'll say for triangle free graphs. Then the probability that v is uncovered, given that v has j uncovered neighbors. equals one plus lambda to the minus j. Okay. And this is, a, this is exactly using the same uh, property. So we're gonna, what are we doing? We're conditioning on the fact that, let's say j is three. These three vertices uh, are uncovered. These are covered. There's, some, there's some, somebody in the independent set blocking uh, these guys. And these three guys are uncovered. That means no one, no one joined to them in this independent set is, uh, no, one jo no one is joined to them in this independent set. And what do we want to know? We want to know what's the probability V here is uncovered. That means what's the probability that none of its neighbors are in, in the independent set? Well, there's only three that can be in the independent set. There, there's no edges between them because G is triangle free. And so basically we want to know what's the probability in this tiny little graph of three isolated vertices, what's the probability the random independent set is empty? And that's, well, the partition function here, it's one plus lambda times one plus lambda times one plus lambda. So, and the empty independent set gets weight one, so it's one over one plus lambda cubed. And this is one plus lambda to the minus j in general. Okay, so this really relies on, uh, G being triangle free, but there's, there's some analogous statement uh, about one over a partition function if you're not triangle free. Okay, and so I, I just wanna end with one identity and then uh, at the beginning of the next lecture, we can use this identity to prove uh, a bunch of theorems. Um, but here's, here's the identity. Um, and so, um, good, let's see. So I want to, Imagine doing an experiment in two parts. One, I want to pick I according to the hardcore model on G, and then pick V, just a uniformly random vertex. independent of the choice of i. Okay, so, so in this experiment, we're seeing um, a random vertex and a random independent set. And I wanna say let y equal the number of uncovered neighbors of v. Okay, so I, I, hear, I look at my vertex V, this is picked randomly from the graph. I look at the neighbors and I say, how many of these are uncovered by this independent set I? Okay, and then uh, we can actually write this occupancy fraction in two ways. And so one is the following. So a ran, the G is deregular, uh, and so a random neighbor of V is also a random vertex in the graph. V is a random vertex, and then you pick a random neighbor of a random vertex. It's a regular graph. This is a random vertex. So alpha bar G of lambda is one over D, lambda over one plus lambda, 
expectation y. The other way of saying this, this is um, 1 over d times the sum of uh, u in the neighborhood of v, probability that u is an i. Okay, and the sum of the neighbors probably you uncovered is uh, expectation y. Uh, okay, so that's one. The next one is the occupancy fraction, fraction is the probability v is uh, in the independent set. v is just a random vertex, uh, i is a random independent set. This is lambda over 1 plus lambda times probability v uncovered. Now we can condition on the number of uncovered neighbors. Right? Because we know the probability that V is uncovered given it has J uncovered neighbors is one plus lambda to the minus J. That's fact two. And if you put this together, this equals lambda over one plus lambda expectation one plus lambda to the minus y, where this y is this random variable. OK, and so the, the punchline I want to leave you with uh, for next time is that now for any triangle-free graph, for any deregular triangle-free graph, we have this identity that the occupancy fraction is 1 over d lambda over 1 plus lambda expectation of y equals lambda over 1 plus lambda expectation 1 plus lambda to the minus y. And somehow y, y is the sum of these indicator random variables. And what we want to know is these indicator random variables for the uncovered um, events for the neighbors, how are these correlated? And we're going to use this identity, and we're going to say, how correlated can they be? How do you maximize this or minimize this? Uh, and then we'll prove these theorems. But I'll, I'll end there for now. Great. Thanks a lot, Will. Uh, are there questions? Yeah, I would like to ask a small one, if you, if you allow me to. Of course. Um, can you please explain this simple thing that I seem to not to catch? Um, like when you choose a random independent set, it is a like it is a finite subset of all of all vertices in the graph, right? Yes. And uh, and uh, the graph itself, like if you are studying this uh, like thermodynamical limit when the total number of vertices is large, the graph itself it itself is large. And uh, what, I, what I'm trying to figure out is that if you choose a a random independent set, or for or like whatever arbitrary finite, uh, arbitrary finite subset of all vertices for that matter, and then choose a random another completely independent random vertex. It seems to me that the probability that you hit this subset with this vertex is like is vanishing in the thermodynamical limit. So what is my problem at this point? Ah, um, so that's a that's a great question. You want to know like. Uh, what's the typical density of an independent set? Um, so, so actually, I think maybe one, this is one of the exercises from, from part one, which is um, if, if you have a bounded degree graph and lambda is finite, uh, then the, the density of a typical in, independent set is bounded away from zero and bounded above by lambda over one plus lambda. And so no matter how big the graph gets, uh, you know, you have you have some bounded away from zero probability of um, if you pick a random vertex landing on a vertex in the independent set. Um, and so, so yeah, this I mean, this is this is a good question about scaling. If we're talking about bounded degree graphs that get large but keep lambda constant, then we're really talking about uh, the independent set density stays fixed. I think I, I, I think I saw a question from a distinguished visitor here. Joel, do you want to ask your question on mute? 
I will. Wonderful. Hi. Well, thank you. Good to see well, you. Um, I wanted to go back to the equation uh, alpha of g over n equals limit as lambda approaches infinity of alpha sub g bar of lambda. Yes. Which is uh, certainly true, uh, but a little bit hard to compute the right hand side, uh, of course, naturally. I guess my question is, suppose you know alpha sub g bar of lambda for some large, and I'm not sure what that means, value of lambda. What information will that give you about alpha of g over n? Yeah, very good question. Um, and you can, you can actually compute a bound, right? So you can, uh, you can say, let me, hopefully I'll do this the right way. Um, but you can say that z g of lambda mm -hmm. is at most uh, lambda, the number of independent sets, you know, the, let's say, num i of g, here's, here's a rough bound, i of g times lambda to the alpha of g. Are you writing? I can't see it. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, on this, this screen share in, the, in this corner here. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so, so here's, a, here's a rough upper bound on the partition function. It's at most the total number of independent sets times lambda to the largest independent set. Mm -hmm. And so just using that, uh, I think you can get, uh, if, if you let uh, lambda grow pretty large as a function of n, you can get some bound. Yeah, I was just um, thinking of, of the analogy to the, um, um, to the Chernoff bounds that, you know, where you get bounds for every lambda, but a, a per if you pick the right lambda, you get, you get a, a really good bound. And I don't, because finding as, as lambda approaches infinity is a hard task, but. It's a very hard task. And, and this also will depend on your graph. You somehow the structure of independent sets in your graph, exactly how this, how this function behaves as lambda gets large. Uh, in fact, this tells you like almost everything you want to know about the independent sets. A phase transition will happen when there's a kink in this function. Mm -hmm. um, and so on. So it really depends on the, the set of graphs. You can make some bad graphs that somehow you really have to take lambda large uh, mm -hmm. to, to start to see the big independent sets. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very nice yes. talk. Thank, Thank you for coming. That's, that, that was a yeah. great surprise. My pleasure. Well, I have a question. Um, so this identity that uh, you mentioned, uh, the last one, um, so it comes from the fact that when you look at the neighborhood of a vertex, you know that you either you can put either the vertex or all of its neighbors in the independent set. Mm -hmm. Is there something of, um, well, I wouldn't expect something of the same sort, but something for, say, if you have KT free graphs, T is fixed. Is there anything known there? Like, what? how do you... Yeah, so you can you can you can do things like this in a lot of generality. So like imagine you have a general spin model and you have some I don't know regular graph maybe and you pick a random vertex in your graph. What you can do is you can actually you don't have to look at just the neighborhood. You could look at say, I don't know, the second neighborhood or the depth 3 neighborhood if you want. And you could ask and then you, then your experiment would tell you not just you would see some graph structure, and maybe if you know it's KT free, you would know there's no KT. That's what you know in the neighborhood. And then you could ask just to record what spins are on the boundary. Mm -hmm. But by this like spatial Markov property, if you know the spins on the boundary and you know this graph structure, you can compute the marginal here. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can actually set up an, uh, an identity just like this. Because yes, you know somehow up. you can talk, talk about the spins here and somehow the the mar the marginal once you average over these two different ways of doing this experiment the marginal here has to equal the marginal here and you get another identity of this form I mean, of course it's going to be much more complicated because you're conditioning on multiple layers and you have some other spin model but you can really do yes that. so you have to actually look at all the uh, all the layers of the say K t's neighborhood right you can just right if, so if you're interested in something like kt yeah you would have to go out to at least depth t probably depth t plus one or something yeah okay thank you 
Any more questions? Well, if not, I, I did send some, uh, well, I, I did resend the lecture notes uh, uh, and uh, also we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll put it on the web page uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. of the course, which I also sent. And uh, once the videos start to appear, I'll, uh, I will also post the links there. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Will. It was really interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.